I always, uh, I'm always reflecting as I sing the words of that song, just how unique of an age we live in when we pray. The day is going to come when we won't need anything. And so we won't request anything. We'll be petitioning God for anything. And where we won't have to simply go spiritually because of Jesus in the throne room of God, but we'll physically be able to go there. And uh, it's really it's a wonderful privilege to be able to pray today. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 in your scriptures tonight. And we'll read the first, the first two verses tonight. And then uh, we won't spend so much time reviewing because I think that most of us have been uh, for most of the series in Hebrews. I will encourage you, if you've missed any of the Wednesday night uh, series in Hebrews, in order to have a cohesive overall overview of this letter, I think that uh, you should try to find it online, try to find the sermons that have been preached, and it should be a real help for you at the end of it. I uh, will say as well, Hebrews doesn't have difficult doctrine or difficult passages. If you understand Hebrews in its context, you see that the passages that are so-called difficult make perfect sense within their context, and that to put them into another context, like a, uh, being saved or being lost, or how to be saved, how to be lost, is certainly not even what Hebrews is talking about at all. And so let's go ahead and read verses 1 and 2 as we begin reading in Hebrews. And uh, then we'll pray, and then we'll read a couple more passages of the Scripture that we actually read last week just to kind of bring ourselves within or into the context of the illustration used in chapter 4. Let us therefore fear. Let's read it another way. Let us therefore fear. Lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And boy, that is a profound statement. Now, there are a few in the Scripture statements or ways of phrasing things that are just so uh, clear and so deep that they just have lasting ramifications and really are verses that I think if you meditate on them become permanently a part of your thinking. There are a couple of verses in chapter 4 that are easy to sort of um, just remember even outside of their context. The second one, of course, would be verse 12. For the Word of God is sharp and powerful, or is sharp there is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Now the joints and marrow is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then verse 15 is another one. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the filling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted to, to, to like as we are, um, yet yeah, without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that is our solution for the problem. So let's pray for God's help tonight to understand. Guys, we're in this warning passage in Hebrews chapter 4. God, let us therefore fear. Let us therefore fear. And God, I pray that you would help us to understand that a promise being made that's not mixed with faith can't be realized by those to whom it's made. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you go briefly with me to Deuteronomy chapter 1? Deuteronomy chapter 1. This, of course, would be the passage of Scripture which is illustrated in uh, which it illustrates uh, Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. Deuteronomy chapter 1. I just want to look down to verse uh, 22 and read down to, to verse 37. Uh, this is, of course, the story of what happened to Israel. And when you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men out from, from or we will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe, and they turned and went up into the mountain, and came into the valley of Eskel, and searched it out. 
And they took up the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hateth us, hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? <clears throat> our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee, as a man doth bear his son, and all the way that you went, until you came into this place. Yet in this thing... Ye did not believe the Lord your God. I want to read that again. Yet in this thing, ye did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents in, and fire by night to show you what way you should go, and in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and was wroth, and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shall not go in thither. But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. And so, uh, let's stop there and jump over to, to the middle of your Bible. Try to find Psalm 95. Psalm 95. I want to just begin reading in verse 6 of that, of that chapter. <clears throat> o come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Then notice, today, if you will hear His voice... Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Now we go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And then verse 2, giving us the explanation of why an individual would come short of rest. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now Christian, this is practically probably one of the best warnings that you and I could be given, and one that heeded could help us in, in, in a way that is so enormous that probably uh, the benefits of it are, are beyond being tangible. God has nothing to prove to anyone. God is not wanting or lacking in deeds which have proved His goodwill or His intention or His ability. As we read through Deuteronomy 1, we saw Moses listing over again the miracles that God had done with Israel in leading them out of Egypt, the least of which was not the fact that He was with them in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, His presence being with them. And yet, the God who miraculously delivered them out of Egypt and was with them and gave them a place to pitch their tents, they didn't believe. They didn't believe. In chapter 2, that verse in Deuteronomy 1 about not believing is summarized not being mixed with faith by them that heard it. Friend, know God's promises. Know God's promises. 
And as you know God's promises, and as you learn what God's promises for you, what they are, one of the things that you'll come to realize is that the greatest of God's promises is the entering into rest. The finishing phase of a believer. The rest phase for a believer. <clears throat> now certainly the intent of our text this evening is warning about finishing and entering into rest. Now, we're warned not that we can lose our salvation, but warned, we we're warned about the nature of a God who can be provoked by lack of faith in His promise. It provokes God when you don't believe Him. You ever had someone not believe you? Is there anything more harmful, more hurtful to an individual as goodwill and intention and he's not believed? Is there anything more hurtful? Has anyone ever proven that he can be trusted to the degree that God has? No one's come close. Has anyone been more benevolent and exhibited more goodwill than God has? Has anyone less of a motive to lie than God does? And yet in our life, in our circumstances, we so often confuse petty, ridiculous, meaningless wants which we have with God's purpose of ultimately our entering into rest. It's amazing when we go through hardship, how little faith we exhibit toward a God who's going to help us enter into rest. And nothing aggravates, nothing provokes God Almighty more than saying, God, I don't believe you. It's incredible when we go through hardship how a person could say, God, why am I going through this? God, why do I have to bear this? God, why is this happening to me? And the reality of it is, is that what you go through is so that God can show you what He can bring you through. And it's as simple as that. It's as simple as just believing God. You ever think about how silly it is the way that we play with God regarding things that we ought to just believe and act upon? There's so many Christians that say, well, I'll see what God does and then I'll... You know, I'd really like to be faithful in the matter of not forsaking the assembling together, but you know, it just isn't quite possible for me. It's too, it's too difficult for me. So if God provides for me, then I'll go to church. And I'll be faithful. You know, the matter of, of giving to the Lord, the matter of giving myself and giving my resources to the Lord, you know what? If God provides and I have extra, I'll do that. Nothing aggravates more God more than an individual who won't just believe Him. You've never been faithful to God and He did not honor His promise to you. You've never been faithful to God when He didn't take care of you. God's ultimate promise to us, though, Christian, is not ease and comfort in this life, which is only temporary. God's ultimate promise to us is that we'll enter into rest. <clears throat> but we're told as believers, and we've seen in Hebrews a couple of things. First of all, remember that this letter is written to Jewish believers who've trusted Jesus as their Savior, but because of difficulty and hardship and persecution, which they're enduring, they've gone back from following Jesus. And because they've gone back from following Jesus, uh, they've gone into really back into Judaism. And Hebrews gives an appeal, an appeal to logic, an appeal to sense, good reason, an appeal that is very, very compassionate for reasons not to go back into Judaism. First, don't go back into Judaism because Judaism esteems and worships angels and Jesus is much better than the angels. Don't go back into Judaism because Judaism esteems and worships angels but Jesus has made us higher than the angels, and so you'd be worshiping something beneath us. But don't go back into Judaism because you're going back into a religion that God's going to judge. If God did not spare the angels, then how much more is He not going to spare us? 
And so that's the warning. Hebrews always has an encouragement and it has a stern warning. And last week we were encouraged that Jesus is better than Moses. Don't go back into Judaism because Moses and his law are everything to the Jews, but Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the law. He's better than Moses and He's better than the law. And He frees us from the law. Don't go back under something which you've been set free from. Don't go into bondage when you've been delivered. This week, let us therefore fear because of the warning of those individuals. Those individuals which provoked God because of not believing Him and not being willing to enter into His rest. As we read through Deuteronomy chapter 1, we saw God was ready to take the children of Israel and Moses right into the land of Canaan. And they went and they saw that the land was good. They said, yeah, 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 it's wonderful, it's great. But the cities have walls that go to the sky, go to the heavens. And they have the Anakims there, the giants. And there's nothing we can do about it. And they said it while they had the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night presently with them. The one who took them out of Egypt with a strong hand. The one who when Pharaoh repented and hardened his heart again followed them and ended up dying in the Red Sea when they walked through on dry land. The one, the God, who provided water every place they were. The God who provided manna and quail for them to eat. The God who protected them from predators, from being prey as they wandered. And the God who took them right to the edge of the promised land so that they could enter in. And they said, we're not going to enter in because we don't believe God can give us this land. And they never rested. They wandered and they were never home until their carcasses dropped off in the wilderness, except for those that were too young to know good and evil. And God raised them up and took them in with a mighty hand and gave them the land. And we ought to be afraid to be unbelievers. What was the problem with the children of Israel? What is it we're supposed to be afraid of? We're supposed to be afraid of hearing God's promises and not mixing His promises with faith. Now let me ask you a question. Might there have been any of God's people marching around the walls of Jericho seven times that as they were marching around each of the times and as they were not allowed to make a sound and they're marching and they're marching silently and they're looking up on the walls probably at individuals, probably at, uh, at warriors, probably armies looking down the walls of them probably with stones and rocks and spears and the ability to absolutely decimate them. They were not men of war. And as they're walking around Jericho, do you think there might have been somebody in that crowd that wasn't saying anything that might have been a little afraid? See, faith does not mean that there's no fear. Faith does not mean... Uh, having faith or believing God does not mean uh, that you don't have doubt. But what faith does is acts on God's promise. It's as simple as that. You could write a check and act on God's promise, couldn't you? You could, uh, you could show up to serve and act on God's promise. You could speak words with your mouth and act on God's promise. You could do things that you know God wants you to do simply because God's Word says so, and you may doubt. You may not have confidence but acting is faith, and faith is believing. And God's people didn't, have, they didn't choose to act on His promise. Sometimes, sometimes we love temporary things too much, don't we? Sometimes we just love things that are made out of cardboard and plastic better than things that are made out of steel. Sometimes we just, the temporary thing, just we're too enamored by it. We like it too much. And uh, that's the way we are with this temporary life sometimes. Sometimes we just want to hold on to this life. And, <laughs> friend, the comfort and ease that you can enjoy in this life is nothing compared with what you'll enjoy in the life to come. And for some reason we want to try to live comfortably in this world. That's not what we're here for. We're here to believe God. We're here to believe His promises and act on them. You know, it's always difficult to do that. 
And yet, when you believe God, you always find Him faithful. And so, the children of Israel died. And they are a reproach and an illustration of unbelief for us. And we're told, look at them and be afraid. You've got to be afraid not to believe God. You ought to fear missing out on God's promise when you don't believe God. You're, you're, you, if you know the Word of God and you let, let its effect and the Holy Spirit do what He wants to do with it in your life, your response when it comes to believing God ought to be, I'm afraid not to believe. I'm afraid not to act by faith. Well, I don't know how God's going to do what He promises to do, but I'm more afraid of what God will do if I don't exhibit faith. I'm more afraid of what will happen in my life if I don't believe God than if I do. Now friend, you'll never find anyone who's ever, who has ever put faith in God that will ever regret it or have a bad, uh, bad story to tell. Any person who could claim that, that by faith they obeyed God and the outcome ended up terrible is a person who, first of all, hasn't come to the end of the picture, and second of all, who's being disingenuous about what their faith actually is. It just ought to occur to you that the first thing that God wants from us is faith, and the thing we ought to be most afraid not to, uh, not to uh, do is to believe. And then we see the illustration, for we which have believed do enter into rest. Now here's the good thing about it. They didn't enter into rest, but we do. Now here the Holy Spirit is not trying to contradict or undermine His argument, but He's trying to say we're in, we do enter into rest. We which have believed do enter into rest. So we're told we're, we're not going to die and not go to heaven. They die and they never enter the promised land. We which have believed do enter into rest. And yet we still ought to fear God. We ought to fear a God who can be provoked by lack of faith. We still ought to fear God who can be provoked by lack of faith. There are so many areas in a Christian's life where God wants to see faith first. He wants to do a miracle. He wants to answer prayer. He wants to show Himself having a mighty hand. And He wants you to believe Him. I just don't I just can't trust God with this area of my life because I just, you know, I don't know what God will do. Well, look at his record. There's a lot of precedent to show that God's always good and he's never evil. What do you mean you don't know what God will do? Will God do good or will God do evil? Which will he do? See what you're really saying is I don't know if I want God's goodness. I don't know if I believe that's good. That's what you're really saying. Because God's never done evil. What you're saying is, I'm evil and I don't like good. I don't want God's good in my life. Is what you're actually saying. You're out of fear. You've got to be afraid of that. As He said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter in my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. For He spake in a certain place of a seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all His works. Where is that? That God spoke of that. What's in the account of creation? God modeled for us rest. What provoked God after the children of Israel had been given the promised land? What was it ultimately that caused them to have 70 years of captivity? Well, what was the 70 years for? What? For not resting. Every seventh year they're supposed to rest. And they didn't rest, and so God got his 70 years. They owed him 70. And so God got him. He put. He said, well, I'm just going to take you out of the land. The land's going to rest. I'm getting my rest. The land's getting the rest. God rested. God wants rest. You know, there are believers that won't rest. And I, I say believers, by that I mean they're born again. But rest is un, But not resting is unbelief. Not resting is unbelief. The notion that unless you make it happen, it won't happen when you've been faithful to God. Now, I'm not talking about if you haven't been faithful to God. But if you've been faithful to God, you can rest. 
You can do what can be done and you can leave the rest to God. And rest in that. Say, you know what? I did what can be done. I'm leaving the rest to God. And I'm going to rest. Leave it with that. God wants a rest. God rested Himself as an example for us. And in this place again, chapter 5, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So in verse 2 we see not being mixed with faith, and phrased the exact same thing phrased differently is that they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Why is it that you or I will not have rest as a child of God? What's the cause of unrest? Unbelief, lack of faith. It's not mixed with faith. This flies in the faith of convention, faith in the face of conventional wisdom in Christianity that says you can burn out by serving God. That's the silliest thing ever. It's the most ridiculous thing ever. That a person who serves God is going to burn out and then not be able to serve God anymore. That's ridiculous. I don't know how many preachers have said, be careful or you'll burn out. You serve God too much and you don't and it take time for yourself and you don't da 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 you'll burn out. Listen, my friend, believe God. Believe God. You say, Pastor, rest. We need rest. Sure. Sure. Believe God. Get the rest you need. But you'll never burn out because of serving God, my friend. No one's ever burned out because of serving God. Nobody's ever had a nervous breakdown because of faithfulness. It's because of sin. It's because of not believing God. And uh, you say, well, Pastor, that's kind of harsh. That's kind of condemning of you to say so. Well, it's kind of helpful if you'll believe it because it's the truth. I always am reminded of Jesus when He was fatigued. And He has sent His disciples into town to get food and He sat down at the well by Samaria and as he sat down, there came the woman to him, and then the whole village came out, and they all ended up... He was too tired to go into town with his disciples, but he ended up preaching the gospel to the woman, preaching the gospel to all the folks, and the disciples came back. He would had a massive revival. Gospel preaching session with the Samaritans. And they came back to them, and they said, Master, eat. And he said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And they asked, did somebody feed him? Did he eat? We didn't know about it. And he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. It will sustain you to exhibit faith in God. It will sustain you to serve God. There's sustenance in serving. And anything you're doing that will fatigue or tire you out is done in man's strength, not God's ability. There remaineth therefore faith, or remaineth therefore rest. Well, look at Verse 9, There remaineth therefore rest for the people of God. In verse 9, For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Resting, resting is stopping doing your works and letting God do his. So we see there is a rest according to uh, verse 8 that's different than just entering into the promised land. And there's a rest that's different than just finishing the Christian life. It's a rest that we can experience in this life. But it's a rest that comes from doing the work of the Lord. Remember what Jesus said to His disciples when He said, Come unto Me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. And then He said, Take what? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, Jesus acknowledges that the burdens that you have are too heavy for you to bear. So what he says, give yours to me and I'll give mine to you. You don't need to worry about bearing the burdens that are yours. Give those to Jesus and let Jesus bear those, and you bear His. 
You know, I think practically speaking, many individuals, if we would practice giving God our burdens and carrying His burdens, we'd have more people serving God a lot more than a lot less. I can't help but think that there might be a lot more people who would be spending more of their life in the Lord's work and less of their life providing for themselves. If they were just to continue to say, Lord, if you'll take care of this, then I'll take care of your work. Lord, if you'll take care of this, then I'll take care of your work. And you just keep giving things to the Lord. Here, Jesus. Here, Jesus. Here, do you know why people can't serve God? Because they're taking care of too many things. They can't serve God. Their burdens are too heavy. And if they just give their burden to Jesus, then they could serve Jesus. But they've got their stinking burden they want to carry, and then they're like, well, if I'm going to serve Jesus, I've got to pile it on top of that. You can't do it. If you're ever going to rest, it's going to be because of a light burden and because Jesus bears your burden. See, God is not telling the children of Israel, you know, I want you guys to go into a place where you're just going to have to work and you're going to have to build, and you're going to have to... No, what did He gave, give them? He gave them a land. He gave them houses they hadn't built. Fields, vineyards they hadn't planted. That's what He gave them. And they said, oh, it's too much. We don't want that. What we'd like is, well, we want to go back to Egypt and be slaves. <laughs> That's what we know. That's what we can handle. That's what we can do. It's foolish not to trust God. Believer, Try faith in God. Try giving Him something that you can't bear. Something that you can't carry. Try giving it to the Lord Jesus and seeing if He can. God, can you handle this? Can you handle this? Well, what, what do you think, can He? See, our burdens are so easy for God. And His burdens are so easy for us. Isn't that ironic? Isn't that beautiful? Our burdens are so heavy for, for us and so easy for God. And His burdens are so easy for us. In verse 10, For he that hath entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Could that be any clearer? Could it be any simpler or plainer? Stop doing your work. Let God do it. And enter into his rest. And then the conclusion is, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. How often do we need to see unbelief not mixed with faith? Unbelief. Unbelief. Before we get the picture, before we get the point. Unbelief provokes God. Unbelief accuses God. Unbelief insults God. God hates unbelief. God hates unbelief. You want to have a surefire mess in your life, just, just give God, just call God a liar. God, I can't trust you. Yes, you've proven me faith, you've proven to be faithful to me, but I can't believe you on this one. This one's too big for you, God. That is precisely what the children of Israel told God after he took them out of Egypt, sustained them in the in the wilderness and wanted to lead them into the promised land. They said, God, this one's too big for you. How many times have you told God your problem's too big for Him? <clears throat> As though you could manage it. Right. And that, I mean, isn't it just ludicrous? Isn't it ridiculous when we look at what our actions mean? For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. What was God's Word in this instance? God's word in this instance is, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. I don't want that word, do you? You say, Pastor, but this could be used to talk about the ability of God's word to get to the heart and so forth. Yes, I concur. But our context is, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. God's word's quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. And it is piercing even to dividing asunder the soul and spirits and discern of the thoughts and intents, or it divides between the joints and arrows of discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Then the Bible says, Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight, manifest is shown forth or openly seen. 
but all things are naked and open under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. God sees everything. You think that your unbelief is unnoticed by Him? You think He hasn't caught the slight of your unbelief, your lack of faith in Him? And then we are comforted with another gentle encouragement. You better believe, because God hates unbelief and it provokes God. And you better fear. That's the warning. Does it make you shake a little bit? You get the, you ever give it a little quiver uh, when you when God warns you about something? You ever get like, oh, yikes? It does me. But then we're comforted. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. God fills your pain. But it was in all points, He was in all points tempted like as we are. You've never gone through something that God does not understand because Jesus went through it too. You've never been through anything Jesus hasn't been through. And can I say to you, Jesus has been through a great deal more than you have and can relate a great deal to a great more things than you even can experience. He's tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So here's our conclusion. Let us therefore go boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Mercy. I need mercy. And find grace to help in time of need. In time of need... We need to go to the throne of grace. And in time of need, we need to have faith in God. Christian, there's nothing better that you could know in time of need than that truth. Lord, I need you. I like the song, I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. And I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. My friend, we need Jesus. And He knows what you're enduring. He knows your hardship. And He says, come blasting into the throne of grace. Just come charging in. Well, let's go therefore boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Don't go timidly to God for help. God, I got a mess! I mean, just go charging in. You ever have the person that, you know, knocks timidly at your door? And then the person's like, hey, anybody home? There's a big difference, isn't there? It's like when you visit grandma and grandpa. You don't knock. Anybody here ever knock when they visited grandma and grandpa? Poor grandma and grandpa. No, you rip the door open and, Grandma, Grandpa, we're here! Hey, where are you at? What's good? I mean, you just go in. Bear hug them. Boldly. You know? You don't enter timidly into a place where you've been given family access. Well, I don't know, you know if I should be here or not. Jesus has been where you are. He understands where you're, where you're coming from. And He says, you just come in a throne of grace and you get mercy. You just put your, lay your burdens down. And I'll give you grace. I'll, I'll, you'll have grace to help in time of need. Are you in time of need? Go charging in. Now, I do not mean disrespectfully. But I do mean boldly. I mean, God, you know what I'm here for. <clears throat> Just cut the small talk. I need. God, I can't handle this. I'm here to, I'm here to leave this for you. Here we have the, you know, I don't know if y'all... Uh, wherever this way when you were kids. I wasn't so much. But uh, I grew up in a house where we had sort of, we were traditional with regard to tasks and chores. In our house, uh, the ladies did the cleaning and the dishwashing and, and uh, the cooking and that sort of thing. Now, kids were supposed to clean their own rooms. But we worked during the day. So my brother and I, we'd go out and work with my dad. My dad, we didn't stay, stay around the house. We went out and worked all day, and we worked really hard on getting our clothes just as filthy as they could be. And my mom would wash the clothes. And, you know, you go throw your clothes in the laundry. My wife wonders where I learned this. 
and uh, you throw your clothes in the laundry and and uh, some kids come home from college that way. I never did that to my mom, I don't think. She might have a different story to tell, though. I'd have to ask her, I guess, <laughs> and see. Sometimes people remember things differently. You know the college kid that comes home with the loads of laundry? Mm -hmm. Brings it in and leaves the big bags of laundry. What's this for? What's you doing with that here? I'm proud of you here because I need you to do my laundry. Now, again, I don't mean to be disrespectful or blasphemous or cavalier about how we approach God. But take your mess into God's place. Say, God, this is a mess. It's mine. It's, my, it's a mess. Now it's yours. If you clean it up, I'll take it back. <laughs> but it's no good to me right now. You'd be amazed at what God will do. If you just believe His Word. And you'd be amazed at how disrespectful it is to God to not believe Him. Well, God, you know, it's such a mess. You shouldn't have to even know about this. I'll handle this one. Well, God, you know what? This is... I, I know you've done miracles like, you know, saving me, giving me eternal life. And you can handle the spiritual things, but this one's really not spiritual. I'm going to manage it. And God says, you bring me my, your burdens. You come into the throne of grace and you'll, you'll receive mercy. God doesn't say, you made the mess, you clean it up. He just doesn't say that. <laughs> he says, well, you know, the blood of Jesus will clean that. The blood of Jesus is powerful enough for that one. The blood of Jesus is always sufficient for everything. And that's how we end. We end with that stern warning. If they enter not into rest and their carcasses dropped off in the wilderness, let us therefore fear. You better be afraid of a God that can be provoked by unbelief. But for crying out loud, don't you know Jesus has been there and He knows what you're going through and He says, come on, come boldly to the throne of grace so you can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And that's what God wants. And so believer, no excuses. Anyone can enter into rest. Father, please help us to believe you at your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>